All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Mental Health and Addiction Services webinar on the quality housing criteria. Um, everybody is muted. We'll go over our basics in just a couple minutes, but we're going to give everybody about three minutes to log on because we still have some folks who haven't logged in yet. So thank you for your patience. Great, thank you everyone for participating in the Ohio Mental Health and Addiction Services go to webinar on our new quality housing criteria. Today we'll be going through a PowerPoint and going through the criteria. We've included a link to where you can find the criteria, but as we go through the webinar, we'll show you where you can find them on the website and then we'll also be pulling them up. So today, we're going to look at a little historical information, some background, and some general information. We do have a few poll questions just to learn a little more about what the webinar participants, including what your role is within the world of housing. And we will be doing a walkthrough of the quality housing criteria. Uh, anytime during the webinar, please feel free to submit questions on the lower right-hand portion of your screen. I'll be doing my best to answer questions as we go through. I do have everybody muted in an attempt to limit background noise, and we hope that you find the information helpful. So our agenda for the day, again, is introduction background. We're going to go through uh, the mental health and addiction services housing values, the housing quality criteria, some additional information, uh, and then we will be doing questions. So we're going to go around the room here at central office and do introductions. Uh, my name is Mindy Vance, I'm the Bureau Chief of Recovery Support. This is Mara Klein with Housing and Homeless uh, Programs and Policy. Roma Bergman, Housing and Homeless Programs and Policy. Jody Lynch, Deputy Director, Treatment and Recovery Support. I think uh, Roma is going to get us kicked off with some background today. So good afternoon, I hope all of your weather is better than what Columbus had this morning. Um, just want to talk a little bit about sort of where um, the idea and the framework for the quality housing criteria sort of emerged from. Um, as many of you know who've been around as long as I have, um, we've been in the business boards and MHAS have been in the business of housing since the late 80s. Um, safe, decent, affordable housing has always been the goal. Now we are really paying attention to the quality aspect 
of sort of the housing that um, we value. Systems um, have always focused on the quality through many venues, um, housing quality standards, licensure and certification, ORH certification, federal grants like HUD, Continuum of Care, some other Section 8 grants, Section 811, HUD 811. They all have had their own requirements in terms of um, quality that many, many of our housing um, settings have had to adhere to for many years. The intent was to just present a single document that really articulated a shared understanding of quality, effectiveness, and efficiency for the housing that is supported um, by mental health and addiction services and your local Adam board. There is not anything in this document that you probably haven't heard at least once or 100 times over the last 20 something years in terms of uh, paying attention to both the, phys the um, physical environment and the programmatic environment. We just really wanted to focus on having um, one document that put it in um, one single framework for all housing types that are supported through the department. Um, the other thing, just for reference, for those of you who love Ohio Revised Code, um, Ohio Revised Code 5119-.22 does have a statement in there that established criteria by where each board in alcohol, drug addiction, and mental health services reviews and evaluates the quality, effectiveness, and efficiency of facility services, addiction services, mental health services, that includes recovery support. Um, there's also another little known Ohio Revised Code, Chapter 340, that has some language that has always required the Adam Board to conduct fire safety inspections and reviews um, of any um, program, facility, um, or project that actually receives Adam Board or state funds. We really wanted to make sure we had a shared understanding of our values and principles. We would like all housing environments to be safe and affordable, to ensure access to natural supports and allow visitors of individual choice. We want them to be integrated in and have full access to the community. We want all housing environments to be selected by the individual from a choice of housing options. Understanding that some individuals do require a higher level of support in their housing, we just would like to be able to facilitate that they may have a choice of where they go. We want to ensure privacy, dignity, respect, and freedom from coercion and restraint. We really would like environments that come from a trauma-informed care approach. We'd like to optimize autonomy and independence in making life choices. And we want to provide access to support and services within community and based on individual choice. And of course, have special accommodations, um, policies, and procedures that reflect those. These quality um, criteria impact three types of housing, permanent supportive housing, recovery housing, and residential facilities, class two, formerly known as adult care facilities. Any housing setting, regardless of definition, that applies for or receives state operating and capital funds or federal funds distrib distributed by mental health and addiction services or your local behavioral health authority also fall under this. So you may call it serviced enriched, it still falls under the criteria. We can call it um, temporary five days. It's a housing environment. We would like them to still fall under the quality criteria. We felt that there's two essential elements in this. One was the physical environment, meaning the structure, the dwelling, the dwelling unit, any common areas, and the premises. Programmatic environment, policies and procedures regarding the services and supports that are in place within the housing to enable it to function effectively. We, we broke this section programmatically down further by the housing type. So there's some guidance specifically around PSH, recovery housing, and residential facilities class two to make sure that we're paying attention to the individual characteristics of each environment. Here we go. Um, in each section, it's, so starting in the physical environment section, um, we cover um, the following areas, code and licensing enforcement, 
legally enforceable lease or resident agreement, Ohio building codes, fire and safety inspections, physical structure, physical space assurances, housing conditions, resident access, disaster planning, building maintenance, and operating budget. And within the general programmatic environment section, we cover policy and procedure manual, non-discrimination policy, prohibition against brokering, move-in procedures, waiting list, program rules, resident rights, grievance procedure, staffing policies, visitors, confidentiality documentation, and resident records policies. And those topics were covered by all three, cover all three housing settings. Within the housing specific environments, and again, this is um, broken down into each, uh, each housing environment, which is permanent supportive housing, recovery residence, and residential facility class two, each of those um, covers uh, Ohio MOF housing categories and definitions, um, which has its own uh, document on our website. Um, we have a lease housing or resident agreement requirement, a quality standard protocol for each housing environment, and other policies specific to housing settings not contained in existing local, state, or federal law. So we're currently examining the implementation timeline and we'll provide this inform information soon. Um, for contact information, uh, for, you can contact myself regarding any que questions about recovery housing and PSH, and you can contact Sue to Freight regarding any questions um, about residential facilities. So some of um, what we've been doing with the quality housing criteria is, is revolving around the state opioid response program, which I'm sure that most of you have been hearing about lately. Um, any questions about the state opioid response program and funding um, can be found on our website, or you can refer those questions to Ellen Augsburger and her phone number and her um, email are listed here. Just to um, send out a quick reminder for any of those boards that may be on the line that are interested in applying for those SOAR dollars, those applications are due March 1st. And we're going to do a quick poll right now. Our first poll question is, what is your role within the housing community? And it only takes us just a few seconds to get responses back. And so we'll share those with you in about 15 seconds. Okay, so it looks like that we have about 32% um, of folks are recovery housing operators, about 27% are representatives of community behavioral health authorities. We have about 7% of individuals who are adult care facility operators, 13% who are permanent supportive housing operators, and about 20% who are community providers. So thank you for participating in the in the poll. So if you have any questions, you can actually type them in and we can try to answer them as they're typed in. Please remember that we're really only focusing on the quality housing criteria today and not really go, we're not going into the implementation of that. We gave a really quick overview of um, just sort of the, the quality criteria itself. We really wanted to walk through those for, it, for everyone so that you can um, actually have a good glimpse of them and then see if there's any questions as we move along. Um, in the overview section, please, again, um, we're just reiterating that these uh, criteria apply to any housing setting seeking levy, state, or federal funds distributed by Ohio mental health and addiction services, or local behavioral health entities. Um, we want to make sure that 
you understand that these were developed just to articulate a shared understanding of our qu of quality, effectiveness, and efficiency. Um, our mission around housing is um, there's some tenants that were taken from 20 plus years of working around housing um, from Olmstead, the importance of Olmstead and um, home and community-based settings. So please understand that we want them to be safe and affordable. Oh, we already went through these. Um, many of these I already went through, but we want to um, ensure that some areas that have been receiving a little bit of um, anxiety um, is provide access to available services and supports. I already went through all this. Sorry, can you scroll up? Sorry, I'm just repeating what we already went through. Um, we want to make sure that we are dedicated to enhancing supportive community living options for people living with or recovering from mental illness and or substance abuse disorders. Um, we want to strengthen the continuum of community housing options through advocacy, education, collaboration with other state, local, and um, boards and providers, and funding. Um, as you all may know, we have four strategies. We would like to develop new housing. We are um, trying to preserve the existing housing, sustainability of housing operations, and of course, to increase and have quality housing and access to quality housing services and support. Um, we're gonna go right into the housing environments, the physical environment. As Mar went through of the list, um, we want to make sure it's very important that there's a legally enforceable lease or resident agreement. Um, there's usually st uh, t local tenant landlord law that applies to all housing settings, specifically um, when you're talking about permanent supportive housing, recovery housing, and then of course with licensure facilities, you have um, your resident agreement. Code and licensing enfor um, enforcement. All properties must be maintained in safe, healthy condition in compliance with any state and local regulations, including but not limited to any local zoning regulations, any applicable Ohio building codes and certificate of occupancy. Again, some areas of the state may not have a certificate of occupancy, but they definitely do have some building codes that may, be, um, may affect your facility. Local building code authority that reflects the current use of the building, local health and safety standards, and any local municipality codes that may be specific, specific to the jurisdiction. Ohio building codes. Properties are required to have a current certificate of occupancy or equivalent that matches the use of the building. I know this has been um, a real hot topic for folks and a real area of concern. Um, you do not need to go and um, petition to get a brand new something to, to show your occupancy, but you do need to be able to demonstrate that the facility that you are operating um, matches the use of the building. Uh, so if you have a place in a commercial area um, and your housing people, you need to be able to demonstrate that you have approval from your city that you can house folks in that um, commercial building. Fire safety inspections. Fire safety inspections must be completed annually and dated by certified inspections, or if your local MHAS board has their own procedure to ensure that fire safety standards are being um, looked at, then um, we want that to be done. Um, it's very, very important that we make sure our facilities are safe. Physical structure. The structure must not present any threat to the health and safety of occupants. It must protect the occupants from the environment and at a minimum, you must either be licensed as a residential facility class two and meet the certification standards, or um, if you're a permanent supportive housing environment, your HUD quality standards, housing quality standards, you must have inspections on your facilities or have a completed home inspection showing no structural defects, 
have completed an ORH recovery housing dwelling inspection checklist. Physical space assurances. Properties are expected to abide by occupancy standards to ensure the physical arrangement allows individuals to have adequate privacy and safety. Um, all housing settings shall have no intervention in place to similar to those of an institutional setting. So you can't lock the doors on a person. Um, and if you do, someone needs to be at the door to let them in whenever they want. Um, you can't use seclusion, physical restraints, or chemical restraints. Um, we hope we're not locking people in their bedrooms at night. Um, and although some facilities may have set times for meals, we're not controlling a schedule like you possibly would if you were in a state hospital or a prison environment. Um, ensure residents have access to typical home areas. These are their home. So we want them to have access to kitchens and dining rooms, laundry rooms, living rooms, entertainment areas. Be designed in a manner that allows for adequate space, which supports the resident's choice in controlling their own schedules and activities of daily living. Walking, bathing, eating, exercising, laundry. Um, we want them to be near bus stops or, or community amenities so that um, it's convenient for them to be involved. We want to strive to try to accommodate individuals' choice of roommate if they share bedrooms. Understanding, please hear me when I say this. If you have a residential care facility, an adult care facility that has 10 um, people and you have a vacancy, a person may not necessarily have their choice of a roommate at that time. However, what I know to be a fact from many of our ACFs is that when a room becomes available or a new bed, people are given the option to move if they so choose want to have a different roommate or a different room. So we understand that depending on the environment, people may not have a first choice of that, but we want to be, as, be able to give as many choices as we can in that environment. So just to jump in really quickly, um, as Roma pointed out earlier and so did Mara, we're not talking about implementation today. Um, getting a lot of implementation questions. So what we wanted to do today was to do a walkthrough of the housing quality criteria so everybody can start becoming familiar with them. And as we have additional information about implementation, we will be sharing with the field and we will have a follow-up webinar. It is really important to us as we try to roll out these criteria that we are doing it in a very meaningful way that is not creating a ton of additional burden on local providers. So please understand we are delaying the implementation, but we're trying to do this in a very thoughtful and methodical manner that's for best of everybody. Um, so back to the um, criteria, permanent support of housing, um, PSH, there's a Ohio Housing Finance Agency design and architectural standards. Um, residential living spaces shall meet the, a minimum of square footage requirements of 450 square foot per individual unit. This is for permanent supportive housing um, environments. Recovery residences. As you will notice, for those of you who are NAR affiliates, um, these are very um, consistent with the NAR um, regulations. Allow no more than, except for this, allow no more than two bedroom adults per bedroom. Should be a documented reason for accommodation may be considered by Ohio Moss. We know that there are facilities out there that do not have two to a bedroom. There's sometimes three or four. We will be working with individuals to um, work on accommodations as they, as they fit into this. Have a maximum occupancy of 16 adults, including the staff who live on site, living in a single family structure. Documented reason, again, for accommodations may be considered by Ohio Moss. Um, we are aware that there are many facilities out there that are much larger than 15 that have been funded through the department. Our goal is to work with those providers and board areas. We would like um, a minimum square footage requirement of 450 square feet per individual unit when operating apartment structures or similar residential properties. Um, grant Ohio Moss the right to evaluate all recovery re residences in excess of 
in excess of 16 adults to ensure they're in compliance with the entirety of these criteria prior to any funding approval. We'd like you to meet the minimum square footage um, requirement for each bedroom, which is 70 feet for the first bed and 50 square feet for each additional bed. Again, this is consistent with um, the National Recovery Residences and Ohio Recovery Housing criteria. Have at least one sink, one toilet, and one shower per every six residents. Please provide privacy in those showers. We want to make sure that we're accommodating um, and paying attention to trauma-informed environments. Each resident must have their own personal item storage space and food storage space and must always be able to have access to these areas. Residential facility class two. That is a, a formerly the adult care facilities. There should be no more than two individuals per bedroom. There are on very rare cases that life insurance certification has granted waivers to this. If it's been um, approved through life insurance certification, that would also hold true for these. Um, provide minimum square footage of 80 square feet for a single occupancy and 60 square feet for double occupancy. Shall be allotted per person for each bedroom. Should include at least one sink, one toilet per six residents, as well as one bathtub or shower per eight residents. Again, these are actually part of the licensure and certification standards. Um, again, each resident should have adequate drawer and closet space in locked storage space um, for their personal items. Housing conditions. The housing and any equipment contained therein must be maintained in sanitary condition. Must meaning we really want them free from filth, infection, other dangers to health. Residents must have access to sufficient sanitary facilities that are in proper operating condition. Um, may be used in privacy and are adequate for personal cleanliness and the disposal of human waste. The structure must be kept free of insect and rodent infestation. And the facility should have a policy in place for eliminating infestations immediately once they are discovered. Resident access. The housing setting shall always be accessible and available to residents. If the housing is locked during any portion of the 24-hour day, each resident should be provided with a working key or access code, or there should be a staff that is um, available immediately on the premises at all times to be able to unlock that door and let residents in. Disaster planning. For many of you, you already do this. Um, but it's really important to develop and maintain a written disaster plan appropriate for your location. So um, if you're not in a flood zone, you probably don't need to have that included in your disaster plan. But if you are in a um, hurricane zone, you're probably going to want to make sure that you include that in your disaster plan and your evacu evacuation planning because it is specific to your environment. Um, Building maintenance. The housing setting shall provide for interior and exterior repairs to promote acceptable appearance and to be free from hazards. The operating agency and owner must develop and follow a policy and procedure regarding upkeep and maintenance that ensures compliance with applicable laws, regulations, and standards. Um, if you come to the um, housing university, we actually um, work with folks and provide um, sessions that really talk about budgeting, replacement reserves, operating reserves, so that um, you can understand what's involved in upkeep and maintenance. And again, operating budget, it's the same. Um, you, must, you should have an operating budget that demonstrates that you are um, able to manage the operation of the house, which accounts for any monthly expenses, as well as replacement and maintenance items that may not be ongoing expenses. Operating budget should be very specific to each structure's address. I'm gonna let Mara talk about the programmatic environment. We wanna do another poll? Uh, I was just gonna say maybe we can do some questions. Okay, we're gonna stop right here and we're gonna answer some questions. So a lot of the questions again are about implementation and are questions that um, you know we're working towards the answer for. Uh, one question that we have um, is 
is the 450 square foot for PSH only. It also includes recovery housing residents that are in terms of apartments or units. If you have been considered given a waiver of the 450 by, say, a funding source like Ohio Housing Finance Agency, that is um, will be acceptable as long as we have documentation that those waivers were granted by the funding source. Um, another question is, can you describe who is a qualified inspector for HQS? Qualified inspectors would be those that have actually been trained um, by the housing authority to do those inspections. In some board areas, they actually have a person that has been trained and they have board staff that do that. Others, there's agents, the agency, the housing agency has trained folks um, in that process and they're employed by the agency. Other places actually contract with the housing authority to facilitate those housing quality inspections. We included that language um, in the document to basically let you know that it's not okay to just print the HQS off the HUD website and check it off. And <laughs> although that's a good idea um, to, to do so in order to prepare for the for the inspection, we want you to make sure that uh, you know if you are a PSH provider, owner, operator, um, that you're actually working with a certified inspector. So if it's someone from your housing authority, most likely this is someone who is actually um, a, a, somebody who is of authority and uh, you know knows what they're doing with the inspection. For permanent supportive housing, this has really been a guidance and a requirement for funding in the past from the department. Um, when there was a HAP program back in the day, um, it's because the primary um, source of funding that you're looking for in terms of permanent subsidy source is through the housing authority. So having those housing quality inspections up front um, really allows to ensure that transition for individuals when they get those subsidies. Uh, do these requirements apply to scattered site permanent supportive housing? Yes, they apply to scattered site permanent supportive housing if the board is funding those subsidies or you're receiving subsidies from the department or through the department. If 100% of the units are project-based through Section 8 and you do not receive any funds from your local board or the department for any operating of that building, then they probably would not fall under the criteria. But if your agency is receiving funding, for your supportive housing in terms of lease technicians, in terms of operating support, then yes, they would have to fall under these housing quality criteria. Okay, um, so on to the programmatic environment component of the criteria. The programmatic environment refers to the policies and procedures regarding services and supports that are in place within each setting to enable it to meet residents' needs and function effectively. For the policy and procedure manual, the list that we included here is are items that we would like to have included in the manual at a minimum. We understand that um, policies and procedures will obviously include more items besides this, but we've included mission and goals, description of services provided, description of population served, resident capacity, physical fiscal policies, including accounting systems, which can document all financial transa transactions, including resident financial obligations, protocol for responding to emergencies on a 24-hour basis, resident rights and grievance procedures, and emergency contact information for staff and residents. For a non-discrimination policy, programs must develop and follow a policy regarding non-discrimination in the provision of services based on the information that's included in Section. Prohibition against brokering. Um, operators shall not pr participate directly or indirectly through the use of another person, entity, or technology referring or re recommending a resident or other individual to a provider in exchange or anticipation of an exchange or any economic benefit, including but not limited to a rebate, refund, commission, preference, patronage, dividends, discount, or other item of value. Move-in procedures and resident selection process. So programs must maintain clear move-in criteria that abide by local, state, and federal fair housing and non-discrimination policies. 
for a waiting list. Um, programs must maintain a process for a resident waiting list that is readily available and complies with local, state, and federal fair housing and non-discrimination policies. Program rules. Um, programs must maintain a process for informing a potential resident of program rules and ex expectations prior to resident moving into the residence or accepting any payment. And we'd like to make sure that those program rules are readily understandable for any resident that is interested in moving into your program. Uh, resident rights and grievance procedure. Um, programs must maintain a, a process for educating residents of their rights. Um, and they must be able to file a formal grievance if they feel that their rights have been violated or they've been treated unfairly. Uh, for grievance procedures, um, we've included information here about the Ohio Administrative Code's um, OAC 5122-30-22.1 and 5122-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2
uh, for recovery residents. We have the Ohio MOS definition included here, including um, the levels one, two, and three. Level four, there is level four for recovery residences, but those aren't included in here because those are licensed by the department separately. Choice, uh, recovery residences must be person-centered in nature and practice and facilitate multiple pathways to recovery, including but not limited to 12-step programs, the social model of recovery, peer recovery support, medication-assisted treatment, or MAT, and faith-based recovery programs. Again, that list is not, um, not all-inclusive. Homes must do their best to accommodate all pathways to recovery, but in the event a pathway is not provided, an ethical referral should be provided to support that individual's recovery. There's uh, information about the social model of recovery here, um, and the NAR, uh, sorry, National Alliance for Recovery Residences, or NAR standards, can provide uh, further guidance by assessing the program's consistency with the social model of recovery. Um, a lease, housing, or resident agreements, um, those agreements should include or reference information about, um, and again, not all inclusive, but a, a list of things that could be included in those agreements, services provided, financial expectations, termination procedures that follow ORC Chapter 1923, policies regarding possessions left following departure, a consent to release information if applicable, resident rights and grievance procedures. Uh, for quality standards, adherence to either to the NAR uh, standards, and again, we have to update this because a, a new one just came out. <laughs> and the NAR Code of Ethics released in May 2016 is required to receive state and local funding. Equivalent quality standards as approved by Ohio MOS may be considered. And we've, we actually have received some questions about this already. Um, there have been, there are other quality standards that are out there that some recovery housing, um, re recovery houses are already following. Um, one uh, suggestion as PARF. Um, and but uh, the Ohio Administrative Code 340 D um, uh, states the recovery housing shall have protocols for all the following administrative oversight, quality standards, policies and procedures, including house rules for its residents to which the residents must agree to adhere, um, which is why we included this um, section. Length of stay. Uh, recovery housing shall not limit a resident's duration of stay to an arbitrary or fixed amount of time. Again, this is something that a resident should be working with uh, their, the uh, owner on uh, rather than having it be a specific amount of time. Relapse policy. Homes should establish a relapse policy which includes procedures um, when intoxication, withdrawal, and overdose occur. Um, and this is uh, where it should definitely be um, important to have emergency contact information included um, as well as protocol. Uh, medication. Uh, programs must establish and follow policies and procedures with regards to residents' prescription and non-prescription medication usage and storage that is consistent with all applicable state and federal law. Um, and make sure that you're reading this through really carefully. Again, this section is included in the recovery residence part as opposed to the entire document because we wanted to make sure that folks um, had an actual policy and procedure in place rather than um, any other um, type of um, things like making sure that um, staff is doing other things besides just um, having a policy and procedure in place. For staffing, um, we kind of covered this earlier um, in the general section, um, but just make sure that you have a written staffing plan in place, including policies and procedures for supervision of staff, um, and that in this case there's a peer component um, also included. So um, then down to the re residential facility class two section, we have the Ohio MOS definition, um, as well as um, making sure that um, adherence to all requirements set forth by Ohio MOS licensure and certification is required um, for those facilities and referring uh, folks to the Ohio MOS website for information and applicable resources. Um, the last thing that I would include here is just to make sure that folks know that um, this document was intended as a minimum um, criteria um, because we have had some questions from folks about, um, especially boards, about additional things that they would like um, uh, the housing that they're funding to include. And of course, you know, if there's things that, that boards are already including that aren't in here, and we definitely want to encourage that to continue. So 
Um, we have another question. Uh, for permanent supportive housing, what if the board is funding supportive services and not property management? How does this impact quality housing criteria? It's still being funded by the board. And if those individuals are on site providing programmatic assistance and services, then it would fall under the housing quality criteria because it includes both the physical and the programmatic elements. Uh, can a local code enforcement officer issue a certificate of occupancy? Can a local fire department handle the fire inspection? In your county, if a local code enforcement person can do the occupancy that has to be allowed by your, obviously, your community, then that's still a certificate of occupancy. We have many. Um, boards or providers that do already contract with their local fire departments to perform those um, fire safety inspections. We have a, a question about patient brokering, which we'll um, email you directly. Just, just quickly to go back to the fire safety inspections. We do have boards that have worked with either fire inspectors or um, other um, entities in their county to actually develop a fire safety inspection that either their staff performs on a yearly basis or they contract with their provider agency to adhere to those fire safety. Again, those would be fine, but you want to make sure that you're working with someone who actually understands fire safety. Um, to make sure that the right elements are being included. I believe we've also um, answered um, a question about prohibition against brokering um, on our FAQs. We've provided a definition um, and there's more information being released um, soon because it was there was questions about that as well as anti-kickback in the Support Act that was signed last year. So there'll be more information coming out about that. Um, we included that language in here um, very briefly. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to provide some more direction um, to folks about that when we do all of our training and technical assistance that will be rolling out in the next several months. It is our intention to be providing some intense technical assistance sessions as we get ready for full implementation we will be doing those probably regional. We'll be doing those by the phone. And of course, we can always um, set up one-on-ones if, if there's some, some particular concern. And always, uh, of course, feel free to submit any questions that you have to our um, email inbox at qualityhousingcriteria at mha.ohio.gov. Or you can always call one of us as well um, as you have additional questions. We would like to thank everybody for participating in today's webinar. Hopefully, everybody has been able to develop a little bit of a better understanding of what is actually in the quality housing criteria. Uh, if anybody has additional questions, please feel free to email our quality housing criteria inbox, and we'll get back with you as soon as possible. And as we have additional updates on implementation, we will be sharing them with the field. So thank you all for your participation, and I hope everybody has a safe day.